Hey guys, I'm gonna do something very different on this episode of Unbeatable. I brought in two guests with me that were part of this very incredible experience that I had in South Africa just a few weeks ago when I did this international mountain bike race called the Munga. These two guys were overwhelmingly supportive of me and I want you to hear what they did to help me during this race. But what makes this episode really special is as much as I hate to do this, I'm gonna admit failure. I'm gonna admit not completing the race. And instead of making a bunch of excuses, I'm just gonna tell you what happened to me in the toughest race on earth, but more importantly, the lessons that I learned. And I'm convinced that if you'll just hang with me for this episode, we've got a challenge for you in 2023 that if you take this challenge, this is not exaggeration, it will change your life. So stay with me throughout this episode of Unbeatable. The best way to describe myself is I'm a husband, a father, a follower of Christ, sometimes an occasional warrior done many marathons, done ultra marathons. I've done multi-day races on foot or with a heavy load on my back, but I've never done a mountain bike event. Lots of competitions claim to be tough. Not all of them are. And from every report, it sounds like this one is really, really tough. The guy who created this race, I told him when you subtitled this race, the toughest race on earth, you are really calling me out by name because I really wanted to see, is it really that tough? Besides competing in the best ranger competition, I've trained for this longer and harder than anything I've trained for in my life. Yeah, it's a thousand kilometers. Some call it extreme, but it's, it's been designed in a way that creates a mechanism for people to allow to discover they have the potential to actually do this. First, I've never done a bike race in my life. Second, I've never done long distances on a mountain bike. Third, I'm doing this thing as the first and only American to compete in this competition. Virtually everything about this is very uncomfortable for me. And the real reason I'm doing the manga is to raise awareness about veteran suicide. My goal is to raise $50,000 for the Three Rangers Foundation. But even bigger than Three Rangers, I want people to be aware of veteran suicide and how big of a deal this still is in the United States. I've looked at my training, I've tried to look at the course, and my real goal is to cross the finish line in less than three days, 72 hours. A small percentage of people seriously think about winning the manga. What's become a really difficult thing to do is to go under three days, you know? That's exceptionally difficult. Winning for me is getting out on the course and actually finding out what my limits are and seeing just how tough this event is and just how tough I am. I believe the average guy or gal all over the world has it in them to do something extraordinary. Maybe it's summit Mount Everest. Maybe it's complete the manga. You have it in you, but you just don't know that you have this in you until you give it a try. Part of doing an event like this and part of a documentary that follows people doing an event like this may motivate somebody to get off the couch and to give something a try that they've always thought they would like to attempt, but they just weren't sure if they had it in them. If there's a few moments in this race where I feel like, uh-oh, I'm in over my head and I don't know if I have what it takes to finish, but I'm gonna keep pedaling and I'm gonna give it everything that I got and maybe I die before I cross the finish line. If that happens during this race once or twice, I will consider it a success. These stories of triumph over adversity will help you handle your toughest days in life and become unbeatable. Jack and David, thank you so much for taking time out of your holiday schedule and connecting with me all the way from South Africa. Thank you, Jack. Welcome, Jeff. Glad to be here. Yeah, great to have you guys with us. You guys were very, very instrumental for me just a couple of weeks ago when we did the manga together. And in fact, 
David, I got a chance to meet you in the most unlikely places, right out in the middle of the desert, in the middle of nowhere, very, very early in the morning. Um, and I got a chance to get to know you just a little bit as we rode together. And I just wanted to invite you two on this podcast to tell you both thank you for the big impact that you left on me for those few days together in South Africa. Right back at you, Jeff. Thank you. Okay, so let me introduce you two to the listeners a little bit. Jack, I'm going to start with you. Your real name is not Jack Black, but to make it easy on the U.S. audience, you go by Jack Black, not the comedian um, movie personality, but um, you have a company that helped me get to South Africa and get to the starting line of the race. Would you tell everybody a little bit about Gravel and Tour? Tell them about you a little bit, but also talk to them about your company. Cool. Thank you for having me, Jeff. So yeah, I think just before I go into who and what I am, um, the interesting thing about the name was actually, um, it's because of America that uh, my name, Josh Swap, is actually, the nickname became Jack Black. A very good friend of mine, um, Black Ride, he's actually got one of the professional teams um, on the cycling Tour de France team for Quebec. Um, and they, we, we worked for, for Microsoft for about 10 years together five years together at that stage and um, we were traveling to the u.s quite a lot and jock is quite a difficult name for the americans to say and swart as well it's also yeah. quite difficult so it became black me swart means black so it became jack black that's how the nickname actually got stuck but anyway that's um, just a little side scene so yeah i'm a passionate um, cyclist that's a lot of um, stage racing the famous harvest that he will share with you now um, been cycling for many, many years, um, doing very mad, um, long distance endurance navigation races, um, you know, over the years and, and just really, you know, started a passion for, for riding. Um, subsequently to, to that, we started a, a sideline business, um, by the name of Gravel and Tour. And that is specifically to, to help, um, not only the top end of, um, the riding field, but everybody, you know, within, if we talk specifically about the manga, yeah. the people that, that doing it the first time, like yourself this year, all people that have done it, you know, six or seven times, you know, come to me um, for advice specifically, you know, around gear, you know, what to pack, what to, to eat, what to, to ride with, um, what bike, what is the tire pressure. And, and that's just my passion. Um, I love um, helping people. And, and trying to get them ready um, with, with advice. Um, that's basically the, the long and short yeah. of it. Yeah, and I just want to say to you, Jack, I would not have been ready. I would not have even made it to the start line of this race if it wasn't for you and your company. And I don't know if you treated me special, but I feel like everything that I needed, you were there for me to help me get to South Africa, get the bike ready and get to the start line on the manga. So this is just my way of publicly saying thank you, buddy. I can't tell you how much of a uh, help it was to me. Maybe we can just tell the one story when um, Jeff came out to South Africa just as a trial run or trial run. Um, to see how it would go and yeah. a good friend of ours took um, then on that section of it of uh, the old steel bridge and they had about 26 not literally 26 but he had a lot of functions and i said to jeff jeff you can do yeah. anything but please just take those tires and throw them away this is not america south africa is slightly <laughs> different and he changed his tires immediately so at least you listen jeff <laughs> Yes, I had so many flat tires in such a short period of time that I literally took your advice and threw the tires that I was riding on away and bought what you recommended. Yeah. And I just want to say to the listener, never had a flat tire at all on this course because of Jack's great advice. Yeah. Good. Um, David, let's talk a little bit about you and your experience, because this is your second time doing the manga, but you've been progressing towards this race for a little bit. So can you explain to the listener a little bit about your experience on a bike? Yes, Jeff. In, in South African parlance, I'm a classic weekend warrior. Um, I'm not very good at cycling, but passionate about it. About 10 years ago, I started cycling to 
to rehabilitate a knee injury from a motorcycle accident. All right. And fell in love with the sport. It's 10 years later. It's probably a bit of midlife crisis as well thrown in there. <laughs> and uh, in South Africa, the, the rite of passage is from, there's a lot of stage races. It's one, two, three day stage races yeah. mostly. And then uh, there's a big one called the Cape Epic, which is an eight day race. And then the mother of them all, Jock, and I would like to believe is a, is the manga. And um, yeah. I started progressing towards all of them and in 2018 completed my first manga. And this year was my second. Yeah. And just to point out to the listener, you've attempted the manga twice. You've completed the manga twice. Um, that in and of itself speaks volumes of being a weekend warrior on a mountain bike. Um, I want to tell the listener, if you're looking for a bike race, South Africa is the place to go. If you're looking for an international mountain bike race, go to South Africa. There are a ton of really good races, but a couple of the world's best races, I'm convinced, the Cape Epic and then the mother of them all, as David just said, the Munga. Um, Jack, uh, one of the lessons that I learned, and and just for the, the listening audience, what I hope to do with this episode of Unbeatable, it's going to be very, very different for me because I'm about to admit weakness that I really don't like to admit. I'll just say it right out of the start. I attempted this race and did not finish. And it's the second time in my entire life that my mind wasn't able to get my body to cross the finish line. The race really is that tough. Um, and what I'd like is for one or both of you guys to just explain what makes the manga so tough. Because when you put the word tough in the title of a race, I typically get disappointed and think it really wasn't that hard but not manga. When it said tough, I think it was a, a gross understatement. It is harder than I thought it was going to be. So can you guys talk about this race and just explain what makes it the toughest race on earth? Oh, do you want to go? Jacques, take it away. No, I think uh, I have to answer yeah, the question. I guess so. You know, I've completed three and obviously this year was, was not my year. I had to just under halfway, uh, I didn't sell felt good and you know the body didn't want to comply and and i had to stop and um funny enough it's also my second time in in my life that that i've you know had to stop um you know i'm also not somebody that ever quits um but what i always say when helping yeah. people is that the manga is a you know if you take a hundred percent um you know what the race the toughness is i would say that 50% of a race is not your physical ability. It's not your mental, or, um, yeah. you know, it's not right. about the mental strength. It's about, or it's actually mental, your mental strength is probably about, you know, 40% of uh, the total compilation. 50% is, um, you know, your physical fitness, et cetera. And 10% is a variable, you know, be it, you know, like yourself, the, the flying to South Africa and, and you know, getting a stomach bug yeah. or, or being at the weather itself, you know, last year, um, we, we go through some of the driest areas in, in the world, in South Africa, in the world, whatever the case might be. And last year we had floods yeah. for the first time in hundred years. And, and just after the manga, a week after we had floods again, which is insane. We, you know, it is such mm -hmm. dry areas. They get, you know, 150 to hundred millimeters of, of rain, um, per year. So it's, it's very dry. So. The long and the short is what, you know, my, my um, answer to this is it's about the mental strength uh, or mental fatigue that you're yeah. going through. And, 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 you know, everybody has got a high and a low and a high and a low. And, and you don't know when mm -hmm. you're doing a physical activity, be it running, be it cycling, you know, when you're on a, on a high because you're just feeling good and you're pushing and you're feeling great. But when you're in a low, you know that you're in a low. And it's how do you come back from that low and get back <laughs> yeah. to, to the high? And because it's, a, it's over a thousand kilometers, you're going to have multiple loads in your, you know, during this, this journey. And, yeah. and that's, that's what makes it spiritually so, you know, fantastic is, is to go through those, those bad moments, you know, and, and you meet people and, and sometimes, you know, somebody drags yeah. you out of a, this, this hole that you're in. And that's also why I'm always telling people that the cycling together with a buddy is, 
never tell your friend uh, at, at what right. bad place you are because you know you can easily drag somebody down because you be human and, mm -hmm. and it's easy to drag somebody down to that same level and that's very dangerous because then then you will go slower and it's easier to rest and and, yeah. and your mind needs to be so strong you always need to be at that positive um, implements of, of, of your thinking, but it is very tough. Um, and just because, and that's why people like David, I've done three, not finished um, the fourth one, but that's why people like David and I go back because we look back, we forget about the toughness. And two, three, four months yeah. after that, we basically say, Geez, you know, why did I sleep that under that bush in the middle of a career? I just right. push, you know. I could have made up that hour and go an hour faster or five minutes faster. And, um, yeah. and I think that, that's part of the toughness of, of the manga. And that's the lessons that, that you learn. Yeah, absolutely. Everything that you said, Jack, I experienced that and a whole lot more. Um, and David, you've done stage racing. You've done the Cape Epic, but you called it the mother of them all. So what makes the manga special for you? It's, it's not to say the Cape Epic isn't tough. Uh, the difference between the Cape Epic and the manga and most other races is uh, the Cape Epic, it's eight days. You, you're out there in the sun and the heat and very technical terrain, probably between four and seven to eight hours every day. But then you have something to eat and you take a shower and you go for an afternoon nap and you have dinner again and you have an eight hours of sleep and the next day, you have breakfast and everything starts all over again. The manga, you've got five days to complete 1,130 kilometers. Yeah. And if you sleep eight hours a night, you're not going to finish it within the <laughs> That's right. If you eat as well as you do on the Cape Epic, you won't be able to ride because your body will concentrate on digesting the food. So it's just one of those races that's relentless. There's just no letter. You yeah. just got to keep going day after day after day. And I think that's the big difference between the yeah. manga and everything else that I've done. Okay, so let me talk to the listener now for just a second, because many of you are thinking, I'm never going to South Africa to do this mountain bike race. Why am I listening to this episode today? And I'm just going to tell you, there were a couple of lessons that I learned all over again um, during this experience, this manga experience that I will carry with me for the rest of my life. And I think I'm going to be stronger and better prepared for challenges in the future. So what I want to do during this episode is put a couple of those lessons in front of all of us, all of the listeners, and say, this is going to happen to you in 2023. And if you'll learn a few lessons from the three of us, two of the three of us didn't complete this year's manga. If you'll learn a couple of lessons from the three of us, I think you'll be better off in 2023. So here's my first lesson. I learned this from Jack, and he didn't even say this out loud. It's just something that I picked up. If you're going to set a really bold goal for yourself in 2023, you really need a mentor. And Jack, you were a mentor to me for weeks, actually months, preparing myself, preparing my equipment, getting ready for the, even up to the few minutes before the race started, you were still helping me get me ready and for the listener, when I use the word mentor, I'm not talking about somebody who's smarter, somebody who's older. I'm talking about somebody who's already gone down the road that you want to go down. And they already know what to expect because they've been down the road and they can start to help you prepare for the road you're about to go down. So I want to challenge the listener, set a really big, a really bold goal in 2023, but don't try to tackle it on your own. You need a guy like Jack Black who can tell you, I've been down that road. I know what it takes to get down that road. And here's some of the things that you need to start getting ready for today. So for the guy or the gal out there that wants to go it alone, feels like you, you can figure it out as you go along, why would you do that to yourself? Find a mentor. And I mentioned to these guys, do you know that this is the first and only bike race I've ever entered in my life? I'm 53 years old and I just decided, hey, I'm going to attempt a bike race. Alex Harris put the title toughest race on earth on this, this race. It called my name, so I'm going to give it a try. But I need a guy like Jack who can tell me this is exactly what you're going to need to do, Jeff, if you're going to give this thing a try. And I gave it my best, but I still didn't finish the race. So first lesson learned, 
you need a mentor if you're going to do something bold this year. But there was a second lesson that I learned, you guys, and I'd love for you guys to talk about this. There were a couple of points, Jack, you just mentioned it, where I was really, really low out there on that course. And I saw the beauty of South Africa. I saw the beauty of the Karua Desert. And I was sitting there miserable and at some of my weakest moments in life and watching the beauty and seeing beauty among misery and thinking even when I'm physically and emotionally and a little bit mentally exhausted, I'm watching the lightning flash across the sky at night and sheets of rain in the horizon, watching it across the desert floor and thinking this may be one of the most beautiful scenes, beautiful um, uh, spots on earth that I've ever been in. And can you guys talk about the beauty of the Karua and the desert of South Africa that we had a chance to ride across? I'll, I'll, I'll take it. It's, it's, it's hard to describe. Um, it's, it's so desolate that you see very few forms of human life. Yeah. You, see animals. you can ride for two uh, hours, three hours and not see another human house, a human car, a human being out there on that desert. That's exactly the point. And within the manga as well, you know, you ha- we're 140 riders that left Bloemfontein on the Wednesday. And apparently when the winner of the race finishes in the Cape in Wellington, the last guy in the race is 500 kilometers behind him. So 140 cyclists spread over 500 kilometers, there's there many hours go by without you yeah. seeing any other form of human being, including another fellow rider in the race. It is it's truly exceptional. Yeah, I, uh, I will remember the beautiful views, the lightning lighting up the sky, the Southern Cross and the Milky Way at night. But by far, the most special thing of this race for me was the people, the other riders like Jack and David, but the, the, as you just said, Jack, the families that host the riders and literally open up their homes At one point, um, I needed to get just a few minutes of sleep. So I went to the family and said, do you have a place to lay down in a barn? And they said, well, actually, all of our little mattresses are full. And then this mother said to her son, take him into your bedroom and let Jeff sleep in your bed, which the little boy did. He walked me into his bedroom and let me sleep in his bed. And I thought, these are the most generous, the most beautiful people I've ever met, just that willing to give you everything that they have to make this a beautiful experience for you. Okay, guys, I'm going to tell you the second lesson that I learned in the manga, and this is on day one. Now, I'm just going to be frank. I'm not going to try to explain and use a bunch of excuses on why I didn't finish the race. I didn't finish. And I hate it when people try to say, well, it was actually somebody else or something else's fault. I didn't complete this race. But I want to explain what happened to me. I flew into South Africa about a day and a half before the race started. And on the flight in, I ate something that didn't agree with me and I got sick. And I started getting sick a day and a half before the race started. I developed a pretty significant case of diarrhea and I got dehydrated. And just so the listener knows, this race is held in the middle of the summer, in the middle of the desert, and it is blazing hot out there at the start of the race. So when the race started at noon on Wednesday, I was already very dehydrated and my stomach wasn't feeling well. And I started the race and then people took off like a bullet when the race started and I couldn't keep up with that blazing pace because I was already really feeling weak. But I started drinking some sports drinks. I tried to eat a little bit of sports bars and I noticed I can't keep anything down. It's coming out, uh, you know, in diarrhea. But about two hours into the race, then I started to develop some pretty significant nausea and I couldn't hold anything in my stomach. So I just pulled the bike off to the side and I put my finger down my throat and I forced myself to start to vomit and it all came out. And just so you guys hear from me, for the first 12 hours, I really wasn't able to keep anything, not even water in my stomach. I wasn't able to keep any food in my stomach. And now I'm competing in the world's toughest race. 
I'm six, eight, 12 hours into it, and I'm absolutely dehydrated, and I'm totally unable to keep anything down. And in the back of my mind, I was thinking, this could be deadly. And I mean this literally, the heat, the desert, and not being able to keep anything in my stomach could be deadly. And here's the lesson that I learned for y'all. Some days you ride the bull. This is one of my favorite phrases when I was in the U.S. Army. Some days the bull rides you. And that just means you don't control circumstances. And some days the circumstances go in your favor and you're riding the bull. Some days the circumstances don't go in your favor and it feels like that bull is riding you. And on day one of this race, I was riding or I the bull was riding me. And I really deep inside wanted to just throw in the towel. But here's the lesson. Don't quit just because circumstances don't go your way. If today the bull is riding you, don't throw in the towel. Don't give up. Because spoiler alert, on day two, I felt great. And man, I was able to put the pedal to the metal and catch up a lot of ground. But David, you were talking about a friend of yours who's a really accomplished writer who kind of ran into the same problems I did. Can you describe that uh, friend of yours and what happened to them on day one? Exactly, Jeff. My friend's name is Brand Pretorius, and he's my stage race partner for the last seven or eight years, and we've competed all these races together. One of my best friends for 42 years now. And we know each other intimately, and we agreed. We did the 2018 manga together, finished together, and the plan was exactly the same this year, just to go a couple of hours faster than we did. But we kept on saying to each other to use that great saying of your countryman, Mike Tyson, and that is, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face. Until they get punched in the face. Yep, totally and recognize it's so, that. It's so true for the manga. So we realized that our best laid plans will probably not bear fruit, or not at least not all of them. And we were, some of those cyclists that you mentioned, flying out like a bat of hell in the first couple of hours, we looked at the statistics on our, on our computers uh, we realized we were going too fast. Our average heart rates were too high, but we felt great. We were just caught up in the moment. And five hours into the race, he, Brunt, suffered from exactly the same nausea as you did. He started vomiting. And to make a long story short, for 24 hours, he tried to keep something down, whether it be food or water, and he couldn't. And in Bridgetown, after 408 kilometers, the medics finally persuaded yeah. him to scratch from the race because they said he's not going to recover and it's becoming dangerous for him to participate further in the ride. So uh, it was very emotional. Jack bore witness yeah. to, to our, our saying goodbye to each other and I was then able to continue and leaving Brunt behind. Um, but I learned so much from him and, and seeing him toughing it out and trying to recover from yeah. From the first day's maladies. Yeah. I hope people are listening to what you two both just said, because if you're going to set a really big goal for 2023, there's going to be some days that you're riding the bull. And Jack, I watched you on the first day. You took off so strong. I was thinking, I can't keep up with this guy. And Jack, you were riding the bull on the first day. And then you and I started to catch up and we rode together a little bit on the second day. And I watched you when you were really, really struggling. And I thought, today, the bull is riding Jack. And you we rode together for several hours. I was so impressed by how you pushed through the nausea that you were feeling on the second day. And at some point, I stepped away a little bit, um, or I started to move away from Jack just a little bit. And I kept riding on my own. And later on, on the second night, Jack, I watched you. I don't even know if you're aware of this, but I saw you come in to one of the water points and you looked like death warmed over. And that's when I realized, oh no, he's in really, really bad shape. Um, and I think that may have been your last point on the race. But I just want to say, I was so impressed, so inspired by the way that you hung in there in spite of how miserable this was for you. Um, I'm really, really proud that we were able to ride together for just a little bit on that second day. Um, let me let me uh, fast forward just a little bit, because as you just said, Jack, I kind of made the same kind of commitment. I'm not going to quit just because it hurts on the first day. But what I'm doing to my body now, 
I'm not sure I'll be able to recover. And like you guys, I've done multi-day endurance events. It's just been on foot with a heavy load on my back in the U.S. military. I've never tried something like this on a bike. So on that first day, when I got in a really bad way, I just decided I'm going to see what happens on day two. I'm not going to give up. I made it to the first race village where you could stop and take a rest. I got there at about midnight and I told the people that were running the race village, I'm going to go lay down for 45 minutes. No matter what it takes, I need you to wake me up in 45 minutes. Throw cold water on me, kick me in the ribs. I don't care what you got to do. Wake me up because if I don't wake up in 45 minutes, I'm going to stay here for good. I'm just going to not finish the race. <laughs> and sure enough, they woke me up. I got back on the bike. I kept riding. And here's the next lesson that I learned, you guys. The mind is always stronger than the body. And there was a point where I really didn't feel like I had physically what it takes to cross the finish line. But I started to think, I'm going to give it everything that I got. And by the middle of the second day, man, I was feeling great. Like I was at my best on the second day of this race and started to really pick up the pace and started to pass a lot of riders and started to try to get back up there and compete again. And the second day was a vivid reminder. Your body wants to quit. Your body will go through all of the aches and pains of something like this, but the mind will push your body farther than your body will ever be able to drag the mind. And David, um, you showed me that on the third day of the race, Jack, I watched you push your body. Uh, I watched your mind push your body on the second day of the race. And I was just quite inspired by that. You guys got any comments about um, mental toughness and what it does to you on a multi-day event like this? Jeff, maybe just a question. I'm sitting here listening to you and thinking the, the way I always had it is the body is tougher than the mind thinks or believes. When you want to quit, you've still got 20% to go. So, yes. so is part of the reason why you were able to stay so tough just because of your background? That's not... It's, it's yeah, not I'm innate not sure. in, in, in the average person. It's, it's because of who you are. Well, I think you just identify, I think you said better than I did. I could, what I was trying to point out about this, that the mind is tougher than your body thinks. And when the aches and pains come and your muscles are saying, we need to stop, this is too much. If your mind will keep pushing, your muscles will eventually start to make their way through it. And there were some points where I was feeling this pain in my knee, which I never have, and some problems with my hamstrings, which I never have. And I just decided I'm going to keep riding. I'm going to keep pushing these pedals, and I'm going to go as far as the body will let me go. And at some point, the pain in the knees went away, and the problems with the hamstrings went away, and I, keep, I kept going forward. And I don't think, uh, David, that that's because of my trend. In other words, I don't think there's anything unique or special about me. I just think that when people have pushed themselves like this, they start to learn some things about themselves that others just don't get a chance to learn unless you, unless you try something bold like this. David, you, you know a thing or two about that. No, I agree. That is actually the gift of the manga. I cycled on the the night of the third day with a gentleman whom I met on the course. And he told me it's his fourth manga. And I said, what brings you back every time? And he said it so well. He says, every time I do this race, I learn something new about myself. Yeah. And I think that was well said. And that's I need you to repeat that to the listener because that's probably the biggest lesson that I learned. Would you tell everybody one more time what this guy said to you on this race? His name is Peter, so obviously credit to him. But Peter yeah. said, every time I do this race, I learn something new about myself. And it's only through that hardship and thinking that you can't go on and yeah. thinking that this race has got the best of you that some of these lessons come. Yeah. Good or bad. It, it really is. There are some things you're going to learn about yourself that you can only learn in situations like this. You can't learn it any other way. You can't read about it in a book. Nobody can convince you of it. You got to learn about it in environments like this. And that's one of my biggest lessons. In fact, I'm going to go back to that in just a few moments. Um, but here's another lesson that I learned. This is a powerful lesson that I hope all of the listeners will take with you into 2023. 
at the moment where I was at my worst and I experienced something that has never happened to me before or since, but I developed this problem with muscle tension in the back of my neck called shimmer's neck. Um, and when I developed this, a writer came up next to me and started writing along with me. And the lesson that I learned is that miserable circumstances are a little bit more bearable when there's somebody going through it with you. The famous phrase is misery loves company. And that phrase basically means when two people are miserable together, it, it seems a little bit more bearable. So David, I want to give you huge credit at this point. Um, I'm at a point on the third day of this race where I literally don't have the ability to keep my neck up anymore. I'm trying to hold my chin up with my hand as I'm riding and I'm hurting and I'm hurting really bad. And not only am I sleepy from not having uh, much rest and physically exhausted, I'm convinced that I lost more than 10 pounds <clears throat> of body weight just in those first two days of the race. But the moment that we met each other was at my, one of my most physically exhausted moments in life. And you rode up next to me. So if you don't mind, would you just describe for the listener what you saw and kind of not only that, but I, I want the listener to hear you literally saved my life in this race. So can you describe this third night together or the second night together? So thanks, Jeff. So I'll, I'll never forget our encounter for as long as I live. Um, and, and what basically happened was the most technical section of this race is a 30-kilometer section between a town called Fraserburg and another called Sutherland. And this year, that 30 kilometers were particularly rough. Uh, there's a lot of times where I couldn't ride my bicycle. I had to get yeah. off and walk and push it uh, because of sand, rocks, all of that terrain. I went through that by myself, so let's say four hours of, of cycling all by myself. It's miserable. In this very barren, <laughs> nothing, nobody, uh, actually a bit scary if, I, if I'm honest with myself yeah. at times. Um, because if something goes wrong, there's just no help. And it was, it was cold. It was about five degrees Celsius um, and with a fairly strong wind, the wind chill factor, probably close to freezing point. But luckily got through that unscathed, and then the road turned into what we call a good gravel road in South Africa. It's the, the route on the way to Sutherland, and the next yeah. stop is the water point nine, if memory serves. Um, no, 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 seven, I think. Or right, eight. that's right, anyway. seven. And um, these gravel roads in South Africa, just to explain it to the listeners, is, is it's, it's lots of sand and rocks, but the cars clear a path by running over the same strips of road. So there's a clear lines that the cyclists follow. So if you stay within, you can cycle, but if you're in the sand or the rocky part, you can't cycle. Yeah. And, and, and it's fairly wide, so if, you, if you're in good shape, you can cycle on these straight lines through this desert road. And I was on this road for probably 10 minutes that morning, and there was a gradual climb of about, say, 500 meters, and I looked up and I saw a red light flashing, which obviously means there's a cyclist in front of me. And my whole mood lifted, because I'm at least going to have company for a while. Yeah. Um, and, and obviously, as you said, misery loves company, so I was looking forward to it. And as I cycled up to, I didn't know it was you, and we hadn't met by that time, I was aware of your participation right. in the race, uh, thanks to Jack. And um, as I cycled up to you, you were on the right-hand side of the road in one of these lanes. And I was probably about 20 meters from you, um, catching up fairly quickly. And at that What he's saying is moment, I was moving really, really slow because I was hurting really <laughs> bad. Yes. <laughs> But at that particular moment, this was about 3 o'clock in the morning, 3.30. 3 right. In the middle of nowhere, and over the crest came what we call in South Africa a taxi. So it's a minivan, a people carrier. Uh -huh. It was the only car I saw for five or six hours on that road. That was a specific day. It was a Saturday morning. You wouldn't expect anybody else to be there. But here's a car coming over the crest of this hill, barreling straight at you and me. <laughs> so I, I moved to the left, and I saw you didn't move to the left. You weren't coming across the sand 
bar in the middle of the road to, to join me on the left-hand side of the road. In fact, you were veering towards the right-hand side of the road. And, and my first explanation was you were sensing me and you didn't want to turn into me as I passed you. Yeah. So I first shouted or just said, come across, it's fine, you can come across. And you didn't move. And this car was coming, it was coming. And, and I said, move to the left, move to the left. And, and I mean, this is obviously as I remember the incident. I started shouting as, as loud you as You were I shouting, could. yes. Go left, go left, go left. And you, at the last moment, pulled your bike to the left. The taxi wasn't stopping. It just kept barreling. You missed it probably by, by a meter. Yeah. And the car passed us, and I was full of adrenaline. I, you know, I was scared, witless. It's probably a stronger word to say uh, that uh, instance. But I was angry. I mean, it was that fight or flight response, and mm -hmm. it was fight. And I and I started shouting, "What are you thinking? You know, what, yeah. what's this You're all about?" Stupid us? American. <laughs> I didn't know you were an American by that stage. So I pulled, uh -huh. next, pulled in next to you, and then I recognized you. And I said, Jeff, I'm David. I'm, I'm sorry for shouting at you like this. I'm absolutely now realizing why you kept veering to the right because it's ingrained in your psyche to keep right. That's and right. Because of, the, because of where you, you, you obviously ride on the road versus South Africa. So I said, yeah, obviously South Africa, keep left. And you said, sorry, I'm just a bit tired and a bad space. Um, and, and we chatted and you said to me, keep going. Um, please, you're going to keep uh, hold me back. But by that stage, I realized that you, you're going through a difficult time. Yeah. And um, it was probably best for me just to stick, stick yeah. with you for a while. David, you were so gracious to stick with me. But I just want to say to the listener, you did save my life. Because of this problem with my neck, I couldn't lift my head up to see anything in front of me. All I could see was the ground directly below my front wheel. And this car is coming at me, but I have no idea. And as we know, the vehicles in South Africa drive on the opposite side of the road than in the U.S. So I'm just riding along on the same side of the road that I would always be riding in in the U.S. And there is a car coming at me and you're telling me go left. And I hear you, but it doesn't resonate to me because I'm on a gravel road, lots of road in front of me. Why do I need to turn left? And then you start screaming and I push my head up. And at the last second, I see headlights right on top of me and swerve out of the road. And honestly, David, if it wasn't for you, I would be dead underneath a taxi right now in Southern, in the middle of the desert in South Africa. I owe you my life, buddy. Um, but not just, not just protecting me from that taxi. You were so gracious. You stayed with me. And I kept trying to tell you, I'm moving so slow. I don't want to do this to any other rider. Please ride on. But you stayed with me until we made it to the next water point. And you, you're one of the reasons why I will treasure my memories of the manga. Just the graciousness and, the, uh, you know, being willing to help me. In fact, I think you said to me, it, if it wasn't for you, or if it wasn't you, some one of the other writers said, Jeff, this race is so hard and so miserable. I don't need to make it worse on you. I'm just going to stay with you. And we'll just ride together until we get to the next point. And I thought, this guy is so kind. This guy is so gracious. I just wanted to publicly thank you. Um, so, so Jeff, I I get goosebumps. Sorry, just to listen to that story, but I must I must just interrupt to say, uh, the, the part of me it sounds altruistic in terms of me saving and then riding with you, but there's always also was also a part of me just to be worried about, am I going to be the last person to see Jeff Stricker alive? <laughs> right. That's and right. I'm going to have to account to your friends and family. So I, yeah. I remember one on one of those occasions where you again insisted that I leave you. So I said, Jeff. I'm not riding with you for your sake. I'm riding with you for my right. sake, sake yeah. and my own conscience. Yeah, So there's a absolutely. bit of that as well. Jack, you, you know about Shimmer's Neck. In fact, you warned me about this months before the race started, and you challenged me, Jeff, make sure that you're preparing yourself. And I worked for months on my muscles in my neck but apparently I didn't work hard enough. So can you describe this medical condition for the listener who I'm certain has never even heard this phrase before? What is this condition? 
Yeah, so I obviously don't have any medical background, but just from uh, the purpose of, of this endurance racing, the first time that I know of this, this happening was actually the race across America, which is uh, where you cross um, America uh -huh. from, from west to, to east. And um, so sitting in, in, in that position, very low, and you slightly just lift your neck, you know, just that small movement. It's not your, yeah. it's not your traps. It's not your, you know, down, or your, your trapezius going down to your lats. It's actually the small um, muscles in your neck that, that collapses. It, it just basically collapses um, because of that small neck movement that, that you're making. You may be just too low. And, and there's actually no medical reason of, of why this is happening. There's no medical reason for, for how long it lasts or um, what is going to happen. A lot of times right. people, you know, move from normal handlebars and, and go into an aero bar and, and then they just need to lift their heads um, slightly up. But other times they are on their normal handlebars, but they are so low that they have to look up. And, and us that's wearing glasses, mm -hmm sometimes look underneath our glasses, you know, as well and do this movement. And, and all that happens is, is your neck muscles physically collapse. Your neck is very, very tender. And um, you, it happens to about five to, it's five to 7% of the people um, riding the race that, that the neck actually just for that small period, two, three days, your, your neck could have collapses. It's very tender and then it's normal again. So, you know, there's no, no, no explanation yeah. why it comes, comes, you know, back to normal again, but that's unfortunately how it happens. Yeah. Thank you, by the way, for the explanation. And you warned me about this. I started working um, on this, trying to uh, prepare my neck for it. But sure enough, on the middle of that second night, probably at about uh, an hour before we met David, I lost all muscle control in my neck and my head just collapsed onto my chest and I could not physically could not lift my head up without using my hand. So I'm riding along and this is just for the listener. There is a point where I start to realize this muscle isn't coming back. There's no way to get stronger again. Unlike being able to keep some food down and my, my legs keep pumping the pedals, the muscles in my neck are not coming back. So we get to the water point. Um, and one of the riders realizes just how severe this is for me. And he calls the ambulance. And the ambulance and Ari, the chief medical officer for the Munga race, shows up. I cannot say enough good things about how well race this race is organized, <clears throat> excuse me, or about the medical care during this race. So Ari meets me in the middle of the night. He looks at my neck and he says, Jeff, you should drop right now because there's no way this is coming back. And it's very dangerous for you to get back on the bike. And now this is where my wife got really mad at me when I first told her this story. I'm really hard headed and I don't want to quit. And I, I really just want to push myself to the absolute limits. So I asked Ari, would it be possible for you to give me a neck brace? Is this an unfair advantage? Um, would it be, disqualify me if I finished the race wearing a neck brace? And he said, well, technically, it wouldn't disqualify you, but I'm telling you right now, don't ride anymore. And here's why. Ari said, the problem starts in the back of your neck, but it transitions to the front of the neck. And if you're not careful, you'll lose muscle control in the front of your neck. And that muscle control can turn into respiratory distress. And Jeff, you're riding into the desert where it could be hours before another human being sees you and you can't breathe and you will die out there. And I said to Ari, are you ordering me off of the course? He said, no, I'm not ordering you off the course. I'm telling you with all of my experience, don't go back out there. And I said, Ari, give me your neck brace. I'm going to keep riding. And I did. And this, let me just say to the listener, was the stupidest thing that I've done in the last six months or six years, because sure enough, I get back on the bike, I get out there for a couple of hours, and pretty soon, even wearing this neck brace, I can't breathe. Literally, while I'm in the, on the bike and leaning forward, I'm not able to breathe, and I'm holding my breath, stop, 
get off the bright bike, stand up, open up my chest, get one breath, get back on the bike. And I keep doing that to the next water point. And that's where David is riding along next to me. And David, if it wasn't for you, I probably would be dead in a ditch right now on the side of the road. So when I get to the next water point, several hours after riding with this mountain bike or with this brace on my neck, Ari is waiting for me. And Ari basically asked, how much longer are you going to do this? And I said, I can't breathe. Um, what you warned me would happen happened. And if I can't breathe, I can't continue. So I scratched at about 790 K into this race, or for you Americans, almost 500 miles into this 725 mile race. And I'm just going to say it, it's still, even though I could not breathe and my life was in jeopardy, it was still one of the toughest decisions that I had to make because I was thinking, I know a lot of people are, are watching me. I know a lot of people are expecting me to finish. But if I continue, I will die on this course. And I had to scratch. And um, it's still a bit frustrating for me, disappointing for me. But David, you've already used this language. I just want to say it again. Mike Tyson was right. In the military, we used to use the exact same phrase. No plan ever survives the first bullets going over your head. No plan ever survives the first punch in the face. And I got punched in the face by the manga and didn't finish the race. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll just say it was still a great experience. I'm glad I did it. I would do it all over again if I knew it would result the same way, just because of some of these lessons that I learned. So guys, any thoughts on the powerful life lessons that the manga can teach you? So Jeff, I, I must just, I'm sticking with this incident of you and I, the two hours or so that we spent together in that night on that road, early morning. One thing that stood out for me, and that is life. You don't have control in terms of what life throws at you, or what happens to right. you, but you have control about how you react to those events. And what will stay with me for the rest of my life is I quickly realized that you were in great physical distress. But the way you conducted yourself, notwithstanding the circumstances, your courteousness to me, I'm sure I, I must have annoyed you in a sense as well, because my, my thinking then was, I, I, I got to talk to you. I got to keep you awake. Yeah, and, you know, keep I don't me want awake. to asleep or something. So right. the, the only thing that I knew how to talk, what to talk to you about in terms of common ground was your, your military background. Yeah. And, 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 and probably it's a bit annoying for you in the middle of South Africa now to have to nah, use another was... guy that wants to chat about these things. Yeah. But you, you answered all my questions perfectly with great courtesy and great thought, notwithstanding going through that physical toughness. And I've never come across that before. Um, and that will stay with me for the rest of my life. So thank you for setting that example yeah. in terms of how to conduct yourself. Well, David, you even said to me, I'm going to ride with you. I'm going to ask you some questions. I'm going to try to keep you awake. And as you did that, I was thinking the exact same thing about you. Look at how gracious, look at how courteous this guy is. I am holding him back so much. He can walk faster than I can do this <laughs> on this bike right now. And you stayed with me for hours. So thank you. Jack, you've My pleasure, learned some, and obviously one of the greatest memories I have of this race yeah. would be that. And Jack, hours. you've Thanks, learned Jeff. some powerful lessons in the manga. Lessons completing the manga, but also, like me, not completing this year. You want to share a lesson or two um, that the manga has taught you? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, the life lesson that I've learned is um, nowhere or with nothing in life that I've done, and I've done, you know, military not to the extreme um, that you guys did but you know it, it it takes you to places where you will never ever be able to go you do not know how far you can actually yeah. take your body um you know when you you know we, we can we all you know have you know like maybe scouts or something where you go through a night or varsity or, or you know right. what an army where you have to go through one night maybe and, and stay awake and, you know, and, and then you think, yes, see, that was amazing. But now you push your body, body for two, three days. So you stretch yourself to a limit 
that there's actually that, that it's past the limit that you thought they were, you know, like two, three times that that magnitude yeah. of it. And I think the life lesson that I learned was was really um, we haven't reached our limits in life. We don't understand how far we can push our limits. We don't understand, you know, what our human spirit and what our body and our physical capability um, are, because you know, without a doubt, we are touching you know, the tip of our iceberg with, with what we're capable um, of. And that's the yeah. lesson that I love about the manga. Um, you know, the, the life lesson is, is, you know, the people that we meet and everything, but the going that experience with them um, and, and pushing through, um, you know, that barrier that you think there's a barrier, but just go way beyond that um, yeah. in life. For me, that is probably... Uh, the single most important thing, um, and, and, and it's from all levels. It's physical, it's spiritually, it's religion, it's everything. You, you go so far beyond yeah. um, what you think you're capable of. And I think that, that for me is just so beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Jack. David, anything you want to leave the listener with? Jeff, for me, always when I reflect upon these races, the last thing I remember is the cycling part. Yeah. It's always the interactions with people and the memories that that create that leave the lasting impression. So to go through these hardships with fellow minded people is, is the gift of races like that, as opposed to accomplishing anything from a cycling or running or whatever the, the vessel, yeah. it's just the vessel. Um, the learnings come from, for me, from the interactions with other people. And David, that's why I'm going to cherish the time that we spent together and this friendship that we just developed in the middle of the miserable moments of my life. I'm going to cherish this thing going forward. Same All right, guys, I want to wrap up this episode by telling the listener about a family that helps support. They've been very supportive of the manga for many years. They're, the the family's name is the Rolf family. And right after the race was over with, there was a series of storms that blew through the sub, uh, the tip of the, the, the Karua Desert. This family, their home was hit by a tornado and it was devastated. And I'm going to ask the listener, if you're looking for something to donate, I'm going to give you in the notes to this broadcast a way that you can donate directly to this Rolf family and help them rebuild their house. Any amount that you give would be very helpful. And to the American listener, I'll just say that the U.S. dollar goes a long way. So if you'd be willing to make a donation in the notes to this broadcast is the account information and the SWIFT code for this family. Um, And if you would be willing to, would you make a donation? I'm going to make a donation to this family and help them rebuild their life after this tornado came and devastated their home. Um, at the This is right after the race concluded. Guys, um, I just want to say again, thank you. Thank you for being part of this episode and helping the listener learn some lessons that can go with them into 2023 on this uh, episode of Unbeatable. Privilege, thank you, Jeff, and obviously we look forward to welcoming you back in 2023 because obviously you got to compete with us. Still, so thank you. Um, looking forward to it. As I just mentioned in this episode, there is a family that has bent over backwards for the riders of this race. They just went through a major crisis when a tornado hit their home and did severe damage. And if you want to make a donation to this family, right in the notes to this episode, you'll see the way to make an international bank donation. No pressure, but if you're looking for something good to give to before the end of this year, why don't you make a donation to the Rolf family? I also just want to say a huge shout out to both David and Jack. But Jack's company, Gravel and Tour, I would have never been ready. I would have never even made it to South Africa and to the start line of this race if it wasn't for Jack Black and Gravel and Tour. So in the notes to this episode, I've also put a link to his company. 
And if you're interested in trying to do a big event, it doesn't even have to be a well-organized established race, but if you're interested in trying to do an endurance event, I want you to reach out to him. I want you to learn from him. And in fact, if you're trying to get to South Africa and to do something personal, I want you to go ahead and use this company, Gravel & Tour, to help you get there. I learned some powerful lessons in 2022 that I'm gonna carry with me not just into the next year, but for the rest of my life. And I learned them in a very painful way on the manga. And I hope you've been encouraged and inspired by the conversation I just had with Dothit and Jack. I wanna just leave you with a challenge. If you found this broadcast for the first time and you like what you're hearing, would you please subscribe on your favorite podcast platform? If you wanna watch the video and see Jack and Dothit, go ahead and subscribe on our YouTube channel. But I also wanna ask you to just follow along with us. We try to put out some motivational content all week long. You can follow along on all of our social media channels. Just search for at Unbeatable Podcast. I hope you have a great New Year's Eve weekend. And I hope 2023, you set a bold, big challenge for yourself. And because of this episode, you find something inside you that you didn't know existed because you really pushed yourself this year. Thanks for joining me. See you right back here next week. God bless.